Well, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're coming from. Welcome to episode 13 of EV Society's Canada Talks Electric Cars webinar. My name is Tim Burrows, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, I say it every month, but I know we have new people every month, so uh, bear with me while I point out that Electric Vehicle Society is a national uh, Canadian organization, and we uh, welcome new members. Membership uh, is uh, free as an associate member, $30 a year only for a full year, which comes with some perks. Uh, if you're uh, a person with uh, my hair color and wrinkles, then you get a $20 a year membership for seniors. Uh, joining, you don't even need to join, but we welcome you to come to any of our virtual meetings. They're held monthly. And uh, of course, uh, uh, simply go to the evsociety.ca, that's evsociety.ca for more information about any of those things. Uh, I'm going to remind you that this webinar is being recorded uh, and we will post it on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you'd like to uh, recommend it to somebody else or if you want to catch up or, or re-watch portions of it, it'll be there for you to see very shortly after uh, tonight's broadcast. Uh, the webinar, uh, all of our webinars are run for a maximum of 60 minutes and we will end it there. So you won't be here all night with us. And um, I'll point out, of course, that all of you have joined the webinar with your cameras turned off and your microphones muted. We want you to ask our guests lots of questions. And so uh, for that reason, you'll see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can put in your questions there. And uh, if you see a question that someone else has, has posted that, that tweaks your interest and you want to see an answer to it, just hit the uh, little thumbs up beside that question. And what that will do is upvote it and it raises it to the top of the list so that if we have lots and lots of questions at the end, we will uh, be sure to get to the ones most people are interested in hearing answered. And on that note, uh, Laura Bryson is with us tonight and Laura is going to be uh, the one taking us through the Q&A uh, when we get to that stage. So great, today's webinar topic is electrification of commercial vehicles in Canada. And we're fortunate indeed to have Ted Dowling join us to present and to take, uh, uh, take your questions. Teddy Dowling is a Canadian executive in the medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle space, and he's vice president of BYD's Canadian business unit. He has spent his career working with teams building companies servicing public transit throughout the world. Ted has served on numerous boards of nonprofit organizations and is currently on the Electric Mobility Canada board and a member of their government relations committee. Ted is a frequent speaker at international conferences on the topics of mass deployment of electric fleets, heavy duty vehicle electrification, and the need for better cost-effective infrastructure. Hey, Ted, welcome to uh, Canada Talks Electric Cars webinar. Tim, thank you very much for having me. Great to be here. Well, it's, it's amazing, hey, you know, uh, Ted and I ha have not uh, actually met, but we uh, had a little chat before this started and discovered that we're both, uh, from uh, uh, Streetsville being our hometown. Imagine that small world. Um, and uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's great to have a fellow Streetsvillian uh, on, on the webinar today. Uh, Ted, Ted we, we've covered a lot on this webinar about passenger, passenger vehicles and related electrification issues, but this is really gonna be our first dive into commercial and heavy duty, the heavy duty segment. So uh, we're really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to presenting and, and explaining a little bit more about who BYD is. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to pass the, uh, the microphone and the camera over to you and have at it, my friend. Thank you very much, Tim. Again, uh, pleasure be, to be here and uh, to talk about BYD and the commercial vehicle space in Canada. Um, I always have to start off with uh, who is BYD and what do we stand for? It's build your dreams. Um, we're kind of, we're, we're known as the, the biggest company that no one's ever heard of. So in, in 2019, we were uh, voted by Fortune Magazine as one of the top 10 companies, actually number three, uh, companies that change and changing the world. It's quite an honor to, to have that bestowed upon us. Uh, we have several different divisions uh, coming from our commercial vehicles, with forklifts, buses, and trucks. Uh, we also have our passenger vehicles, and I'll touch on that. We uh, we have a, a wonderful line of, of 
passenger vehicles for everywhere but North America. We, uh, we, there is no firm timeline of if and when they are going to bring them here. Um, we hired a, a designer uh, from Audi named Wolfgang Egger, and he thought it was about four years ago, and he has done a fantastic job with our vehicles, and they are state-of-the-art, they're beautiful cars, and uh, I'm trying so hard to get one for me even just to, to drive here, but it's not allowed yet. And we also have um, our energy solutions, uh, where, where we produce uh, energy storage. Uh, we are the largest manufacturer of energy storage in the world, 60 gigawatt hours last year alone. Um, we build a variety of different chemistries of uh, batteries. Um, for, for transportation, we stick with lithium ion iron phosphate. Uh, it's very safe, and which I'll get to in, in, a, in a minute. Uh, we talk about an interesting story. Uh, Chairman Wong, um, he, uh, he actually drank the uh, electrolyte from the battery cell in one of his presentations to show how safe it was. Uh, so he's still around. It was about uh, 10 years ago. He's still around today. Um, we also have a uh, major IT um, electronics division. Uh, we work with some of the some incredible innovative companies in the IT space, you know, not just doing contract manufacturing, but also having input into their designs. Uh, we also have an office in Silicon Valley. Uh, the companies we work with are Google and Apple and Samsung, Microsoft, uh, just to name a few. Uh, last year, we shipped about 70 million, 70, 70 million consumer electronic devices. Um, we also manufacture things like cell phones and computer housings. And ultimately, one of our core competencies is a company throughout all of our product lines is high volume, high precision manufacturing. Um, to go on to the SkyRail, that's one of our divisions. We were just uh, named in uh, Los Angeles for the uh, Sepulveda uh, route where we're going to be doing a proposal. There's uh, high, road, uh, high sky rail proposal as well as a subway proposal in that area. So, you know, wh why sky rail? Um, why monorail? Kind of seems like an old technology, but uh, it is actually very futuristic and the cost is about 15% of that of a, of a subway system. So you can move the same amount of people uh, with a much more, much cost effective solution. And then as mentioned, commercial vehicles, and that's what this is really all about. So a little bit more history on BYD. Uh, 2008, uh, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and uh, Bill Gates came to visit our facility in, in uh, Shenzhen. And it was really Char Charlie Munger who, who pushed it. Um, and they ended up buying 10% or investing 10% in the organization. Uh, we are a publicly traded company. Uh, but I understand about 70% of the ownership of BYD is, in, is North American. Um, but yeah, it's been turned out to be one of his best in investments, one of their best investments. In 2014, we opened up our, our bus manufacturing facility with about 30,000 square feet. And uh, today it's 550,000 square feet in Lancaster. Uh, we employ about 950 employees there. Um, truly a global company that likes to um, localize. We did something similar in 2019, though on a smaller scale, uh, in order to meet the Canadian content requirements for the TTC bus order, we, uh, we opened a facility in Newmarket, Ontario. Uh, just those 10 buses alone, we created over 30 direct jobs working on the vehicles. And uh, we also created more jobs throughout the industry. Uh, we had the windows built in Winnipeg. We had the um, mirrors built in Oakville. Uh, the, um, the ramp for the wheelchair was built in Quebec. So we really tried to find a way to create jobs uh, while building the vehicles here, and th therefore creating a, more of a of a market for new, new buses to be manufactured again in Canada. There used to be a, a facility in Oakville, Orion bus. I'm not sure if everybody remember that or Mississauga, sorry, that uh, it, it shut down in 2012-ish. So we're, we're, we, we brought it manufacturing back to Ontario buses. Very proud of that. Uh, we have the largest selection of commercial buses available um, under one brand, you know, 12 models ranging anywhere from 28 to 60 feet. We're, we have the bendies, the articulated. We have the low floor buses, the, art, the double deck buses, and we have uh, the um, highway coaches as well. Some of our applications are, are you know, the standard transit agency, but we also operate at, at airports. And for example, Schiphol in Amsterdam uses our, our bus. Um, universities, UCLA and Stanford were one of the first uh, purchases of our vehicles. And then corporations, you don't, you don't think of this, but uh, in, in the Bay Area, for example, people get off at the BART and they hop in one of our double-deckers. 
that's owned by Genetech, and they go, they basically start working from that time they get off the, uh, the train into the, into the city. They're working on Wi-Fi, luxury seats. So it's a really good way to uh, reward your employees. And then tourism, of course, West Coast sightseeing uh, here in Vancouver, operate our buses as well as Wilson uh, in uh, Victoria. And we also have uh, Tofino bus, which we're putting a service in service this coming uh, summer will be a, uh, a shuttle bus in Tofino. So I, I, I have no problem going up there and, and taking care of that customer anytime they want. And of course, you know, one of the things that we looked at uh, when you look at getting into the commercial bus business is, is how do you ease uh, customers' minds? You know, it, it, a bus battery is more expensive, a bus, battery electric bus, sorry, is more expensive than your standard diesel bus. So we looked at the most expensive component on the vehicle, and of course, we manufacture that component. So we said, why don't we just give them a 12 year warranty? So we say 12 year warranty or a lifetime warranty because that's pretty much how long the bus is supposed to last in the, in the, United States. So, and uh, next slide is basically what I'll explain that. So uh, we have what's called the Altoona test in the US. It's a Penn State run. Um, and any bus that is required uh, to use federal funds. So in the US, it's 80% of the funding for buses is uh, covered by the FTA. And because of that, they require this Altoona test. And all the buses, even in Canada, a lot of the big agencies, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, you name it, they all want the Altoona test done, even though it's not a standard in Canada. And even though we operate our buses for a lot longer than they do in the US, like sometimes 18 to 20 years, and I'll have a slide at the end about that, um, you'll see uh, that, that they have to be tested. So we do this testing and it, it really is a structure and durability test, shows that the bus is gonna last for 12 years, you're supposed, that's supposed to. This gives more peace of mind again to the, uh, the transit authority, making it easier to, to switch over to a, a, a unproven technology, as they say. Um, our electric truck applications, you know, we, we, we are in, the, uh, in this business as well. You don't hear about us as much as the other guys. Uh, we actually do deliver products. Uh, our class eight uh, truck is a, is a day cab. We're not really into the long range. It's it's mostly your your drage, your your heavy emitters, which is your day use cabs, um, the terminal and ports. You know those are these are the ones that operate at uh, your your uh, distribution centers, and they, they run for 16 hours a day. And and they're workhorses. They're not pretty to look at, but they work extremely well. Uh, the delivery vans. Like this is a huge market right now with all these this uh, deliveries at home with um, Amazon uh, and blah blah all making home deliveries, it's, it's really picked up and, and put the focus on electrifying this, this market segment. And then of course, refuse and recycle, those big, you know, class, class eight trucks that pick up your garbage and the brakes squeal and wake you up every morning. Well, now you won't be woken up by them because they're very quiet and uh, you don't, uh, regenerative braking means you barely even apply the brakes and it's really just perfect for the duty cycle, for an electric, uh, electric duty cycle. Um, so one of the things we talk about, you know, where it says, what's build your dreams? And, and our chairman came up with the, the, the three green dreams. And really it's this, it's the zero emission energy ecosystem. It's, it's uh, harnessing the power from the sun and wind, put it into batteries, and then putting that power back into either your, your, your cities or your residential or, or specifically your commercial uh, vehicles. Um, we, we really focus on, on the commercial side of it because you know, around the world, 10% of the vehicles are commercial, yet they are responsible for 60% of the emission, emissions, over 60%. So really tackling that commercial vehicle um, is, is the key to reducing the emissions. Here's a, an example of our energy storage systems we have. This is just a simple CCAN setup uh, where they can be remote areas. Um, there's, there's somewhere behind there, there's either a solar power grid or, or a, uh, sorry, solar power system or or turbines, wind turbines that are feeding into this. And then at any time arbitrage, whether it's arbitrage power or not, basically just turns on and, and, and supplements the grid with power. So it's really good for, for peak, uh, peak shading. As mentioned, we do manufacture solar panels. We're in the top five in the world for solar panel manufacturing. Um, this is something that uh, we continue to improve on every year. And in fact, you know, I think over the 
last five years, we've taken the density of one solar panel and put it into one little square on the solar panel. So it's getting so much more uh, efficient. And, uh, you know, with the bifacial panels they have today where you actually can have it in, let's say you have it in Edmonton and uh, there's snow on the ground, you can get it from the back. So it bouncing off the snow will be able to generate power as well. It's really, uh, it's really key and critical. So some of our, our bus customers in, in the US, we're in 15 different uh, uh, states in the US and four different um, provinces here in Canada. Um, you know, we started uh, 2017 was our first order with uh, St. Albert bus. So we, we went cold and then we went to Grand Prairie after that. So we went even colder and just to prove the technology out that the bus does work in the cold weather. And that's really, uh, it's really been quite a great trip for us. So here's just a couple of logos of uh, some of our customers, our, our, our customers, and then the, uh, the repeat customers, as they say, the, ha the happier customers. Um, so we really pride ourselves on our battery technology. Uh, if you look at the battery recycling being a huge part of it, you know, if we're, if we're gonna have 16,000 electric buses in Canada, that's a lot of batteries in, in 20 years that we're gonna have to deal with whether they're gonna be recycling those or reusing them, putting them back in and using energy storage systems. You know, we're gonna to have to address that at the time. It would be pretty, uh, uh, pretty bad of us not to look at the future consequences of this. So we, we have looked at it. Our, we've decided the technology that we're going for is the lithium iron, iron phosphate. It is uh, not only the most, the safest battery in the world, it's got non-toxic chemistry, chemistry, it's high energy density, um, not, not as high as your, as your other batteries uh, that you see out there with cobalt and that in them. Um, it's a, it, adds, it works in a wide, wide variety of temperatures, uh, as well as uh, the battery thermal management, water cool design. So really just to keep that uh, battery at the optimal temperature makes it last, last longer. And uh, you know, we, we test our batteries thoroughly. And in fact, if you, if you Google um, BYD blade, uh, BLADE battery, they'll, they'll show a, a wonderful uh, demonstration of, of the test that it goes through and a comparable to other car manufacturers' batteries. And it just shows you that the safety, the, the impact, what happens with our battery and the puncture, there's, there's no thermal, uh, there's no thermal engagement. There's, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't explode or anything. You can light it on fire. It, uh, it, it bonds the chemical and it, it puts the fire out itself. Uh, we do, incredible amount of testing on crushing, vibration, and, and uh, other things as well. So, so here's some of the certifications for our, our, our batteries. When you, when you talk about fleet, um, commercialization of fleet electric buses, electric trucks, you really have to look at you know, the charging side of it first, almost before you do anything, you have to say, can we charge these vehicles? So one of the things about BYD is we are, we are charger agnostic. Yes, we do make our own charger. It's an AC charger, as you see here, with, with a, uh, a European style plug. Uh, but we do offer several other types. And, and really, we, want, we don't want to be closed, closed minded about any other technology that's out there. So whether it's uh, induction charging, as you can see here, uh, this is momentum dynamics where they, they pull over the pad. Uh, there's also another company called Wave in uh, Salt Lake City. They offer this very similar design. And really, not, being, not having to plug your vehicle in, I, I still can't believe we're on you know, 10 years or 12 years after the, the first Tesla came out and we still have to plug vehicles in. So really, this is the future, we believe, of other technology. We also, there's overhead charging as well. The, the, the downside this, is it's moving, it's a moving component, um, it's costly, and uh, you just have, you constantly have to look at the maintenance of it. You can, these also can be operated uh, as, a, as a very high speed uh, transmission, up to 450 kilowatt hours, um, but they can also go down to, uh, to slower as well. So in a depot where you look at having these, where you're putting 300 buses into one, one facility, you wouldn't want to charge them all at, at the same time, or at a, at a really high rate. You'd want to you want to charge them at a lower rate. You know, it's okay to plug a couple of buses in, but as soon as you plug 100, 100 in, you're looking at uh, blowing a grid up. So yeah, the key is to really make these uh, grid friendly. So on that note, we partnered with a company called Ampli uh, for just to, to charge, making it 
as they say, fleet charge and simplified. Um, you know, when a when a transit authority or or a fleet a fleet manager like Wayne Scott from Loblop, he looks at his fleet, how he's going to do this. He, before it was just okay, I'm going to buy this bus, I'm going to park a truck, I'm going to park it there, and that's it. I'm going to fill it up with fuel, or we're going to buy a bus. It's going to come in, it's going to fill up with fuel, get cleaned, and then go go sleep for the night in the garage. Well, that's not that's not the way it works anymore because these are actually buses that are going to be and trucks that require electricity during the nighttime when they're not being used. So you're be able to take that power and hopefully at the time it's surplus power because in the evening when you don't have the demand and we're filling up these uh, these 350 to 600 kilowatt hour batteries and that that's that that's where a company like Ampli comes in because what they can do is they can set your infrastructure upgrades they can they can do everything on the side that you're not used to doing a fleet manager wouldn't be used to and then taking that off their hands and allowing the fleet manager to do what they do and that's to manage their their trucks and buses that's it get them on the road and make sure they make revenue so they have several different offers and, and this is all really to make commercialization easier and and, and cost effective as well the um certainly you know, looking at their software systems they have being able to charge uh, vehicles at different times uh, allowing them to um, to maneuver the charging so that one they could actually specify that one one bus they want to charge or one truck they want to charge ahead of another one. So really, it comes down to again not looking at uh, at the existing model today of diesel and saying and doing the exact same thing. It's a completely different mindset when you're when you're looking at electrifying uh, fleets. So um, also when you look at the time of day when they're when they're charging. These vehicles may have a, a peak demand, and we've seen that in California, where uh, all of a sudden they're saying, "Okay, between uh, between one and four o'clock, go ahead, fill your boots because the solar's on." And then at uh, at seven, seven o'clock or, or late at night, they're like, "There's no more solar. You're going to get penalized." And they get charged, you know, up to twenty-four dollars a kilowatt hour. So that's uh, that's a lot more expensive than, than diesel fuel at that time. So just a couple more examples of what they could do. Um, so we've done a lot of large-scale charging infrastructure uh, you know, in, in Lancaster, which certainly is our, our, our backyard with uh, ABTA. Um, Santiago, Chile is the latest one we worked at, and of course, Shenzhen. And if you go to Shenzhen today, um, you've got uh, uh, almost 17,000 no, 17, electric buses. They've replaced all of the diesel buses since 2011, um, 18,000 electric taxis. It's, it's the quietest, biggest city in the world. It's, it's, it's un, unreal. You can actually sit on a patio and have a beer outside and the buses go by, you can hear yourself talk. It's, it's a game changer when it comes to cities and, uh, and just getting rid of that, that noise level that, that's attributed with the diesel, diesel engines. So as, as I mentioned, we focus on the cold weather. I kind of, I like this one. Uh, you know, St. Albert was our first customer and uh, still is a, a great customer of ours. Um, we, uh, there was one day that th I took this picture. It was uh, too cold for penguins in Calgary, but yet the, our electric buses were running just great. So I, I don't tweet very often, so I had to tweet that. It's pretty, uh, pretty cool to see. Um, so if, if you've recently seen, uh, the TTC has the largest electric uh, bus fleet in Canada now, actually North America with 60. And uh, what they did was they, uh, they said, uh, they actually had a procurement out and they were going to buy 440 diesels. Um, but there was a few councillor members and uh, deputy mayor that got together and said, no, 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 we, uh, we can't have this happen. We want to go electric now. We want to go sooner than we don't want to buy no more diesel buses and, and have them in our fleet for another 15 years. So they really pushed uh, the, the TTC um, hard and, and, and to their credit, uh, Ben Case and his team, Mike Mackis, they all came back and, and they, they came up with a new procurement for 60 buses. And 10, the first 10 of each uh, from each manufacturer was going to be going in a head-to-head -head, um, uh, uh, comparison and basically to evaluate these apples to apples. And uh, what they did, they issued their first report and it came out, and I, I, I'm a I'm mine for uh, golden nuggets here. So they talked about the mean distance between failure. Uh, the, good, the great thing about this, obviously uh, we're purple, you we can't really see it, but uh, um, we end up, we were on a very good trend to be above that. We, we didn't get our buses in service uh, for as long as the other company did at this point. Uh, I was a little, a little bit behind, but 
our, our trend is very is excellent. The other thing you look at is the energy consumption. Consumption, you know, one point two one is an average, um, which is which is pretty phenomenal when you look at a. Uh, we were at some points we were below one kilowatt hour per kilometer, which is which is the best in the industry. So we we really our technology is our core business. Um, that's where we thrive. And again, energy consumption here, you see that we were actually below the um, below one uh, and at the highest 1.56. Now this is using a, uh, uh, we use a, a, a hybrid electric and diesel um, heater. So we very, very rarely use diesel. In fact, we use five liters per 100 kilometers uh, during the uh, cold, cold weather. Another good example here is the, is the range. I explained the, the hybrid there. So we, uh, for the um, battery consumption again, did extremely well. And then again, this is the, one of the biggest and best takeaways that I, I go here are, are, are better than diesel, obviously, but much better than competition, 24 cents a, a kilometer in operations costs. And when you look at the operations and energy costs uh, at a transit authority, you know, all those operations costs, about 31% of them come, or sorry, 69% of them come from the uh, taxpayer's money. Now, only 31% of the money is uh, covered out of the fare box. So that's really important that, you know, this, this money that we use, the infrastructure money that's put in place to buy transit buses and needs to be spent more on the capital procurement upfront costs as opposed to the operating costs down the road. So you you minimize your operating costs by using more capital money up front to buy the electric bus. And uh, then everybody's better off. The cities are better off. Hopefully we, we pay less taxes. Uh, I'm not gonna guarantee that, but hopefully we do. If I was mayor, we would. <laughs> so we always uh, kind of say electric buses are always the cleanest cleanest option. And, and this, is, this is the US stat. It's an, it's an average grid mix. So they have coal in here. They have natural gas, um, electric, electric production they have. Um, also mixed in with this, um, um, uh, it's escaping hydro as well. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of different mixes. So if you look at British Columbia, which is hydro, um, hydro Quebec as, as well. So th there's quite a quite a few uh, uh, green places in in Canada where we can uh, create really clean clean electricity. It depends on who you ask. There's a, certainly people on either side to say hydro isn't too clean for the first 30 or 40 years. I think Bill Gates said that. So I'm not sure whether you trust him or not. But. Anyway, so, so this is a really good stat. That kind of leads me into the next next couple. And, and this is where I want to talk about the Canadian public transit fleet. Now, there's over 16,800 heavy duty, 30 to 45, sorry, 30 to 60 foot buses operating in your cities. Of them, 93% are diesel. Now, they could be hybrids, but there's really not a lot of change, uh, not that much of a savings in, in, in uh, CO2 emission, or sorry. Uh, PHG emissions from a hybrid and a diesel. It's not a great drop off, maybe a, a 20% at the most. Um, but if you look at here, you know, CNG was supposed to be the next wonder fuel. Well, only 4.69% of the buses in Canada are, CNG, are compressed natural gas. In the US, it's a similar, similar percentage. It just didn't catch on. It caught on in California, and then they realized how bad it was for the environment and the people itself. So they stopped, they've stopped using it, or they're going to stop using it. Sorry. Electric trolleys, those are all in Vancouver. Uh, so they actually hook up to the wires. Um, and then as far as the battery, you know, less than a percent is battery electric. Now we've had uh, technology for battery electric buses since 2010. Uh, Canada and, and, and the United States have, you know, the barriers to entry here are quite different. We can, we can deliver a, a 400 bus order to Chile and 200 to a place in Amsterdam and all over the world we're, we're delivering these, these mass deployments of electric buses. The public procurement process we have in Canada is quite different. It doesn't allow you really to do that. These are, these are procurements like, for example, in Chile, where they, they partner with the utilities and the utility owns the buses and they let the, uh, the contractor operate them. So there's really just a new way to think about how to replace these old buses. Now, to go on to the next, next slide here, kind of open up everybody's eyes about these emissions of vehicles. So of the 15,634 that are diesel, this is the one that, that gets me every time. And I've got, a, I've got the, uh, the link to the stat as well. Uh, so 2010 and newer, there's, there's 9,300 and they're 59%, sorry, I'm on that right one. Yes, 59% and 2004, 
30, it was 22 percent of them, and then two, EPA 2007 engines. These are the engines. So, what people don't understand is um, diesel engines and buses basically are in the, that as the year that they are produced. They don't need to be upgraded. They don't need to have any particular trap filters on put on them. They are basically kept in the original state. That means they produce the emissions from that original state. So the emissions for 2004 for NOx was 2.4 uh, per, and I, I can't remember the exact ter term it is. Uh, in 2007, it was 2.1.2. Uh, and in 2010 and older and newer, it's 0. Point, oh, sorry, yeah, 0. 0.02. So put it into perspective, uh, the 2004 buses, which there are 22%, have 92% of the emissions put out by buses. Now, you may say, ah, who's operating those vehicles? There are almost every transit authority in Canada is operating vehicles with 2004 engines, a certain amount of them, some higher than others. You'd be surprised there's 200 operating in, in one city right now. And the reason they're operating these is because they're cheap. They don't require any of the filters and any of that work to be done on them. They're, they're workhorse engines that pretty much old Detroit diesels that there's nothing to do, nothing to go wrong with them. So that's, that's what they, uh, they really focus on getting those buses and keeping them on the road. So as me, as an electric bus uh, builder and electric truck builder, uh, we, we're really focused on getting those vehicles off the road. Those are producing the most emissions. And so it's critical we do that. And that is all. I hope I didn't run too fast on there for you. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the questions and uh, please feel free to challenge me. That's, that's great, Ted. That's great, Ted. Um, Laura, how about you uh, take a look? I think we've got some questions on the list. Let's, let's take a, a run at them. Sounds great. There's so many good questions coming in. I only want the bad ones. <laughs> so we've got uh, one from Sebastian. Hi, Ted, I see a garbage truck and a city bus on one of your slides. Is the municipal market an important segment of your business development strategy for Canada? Absolutely, it is. Um, when you look at the incentives that are out there today for uh, municipalities, um, British Columbia and Quebec have some excellent incentives, $170,000 for a truck for a, uh, in, the, in the Quebec, uh, which is the, it's up to $170,000. Um, and then in British Columbia, it's $100,000 per truck to up to a certain amount. But really, they're, they're, they're trying to push the, get rid of these commercial vehicles that are they're operating in cities, um, garbage trucks being specifically, they, they, they operate for eight hours a day. Uh, they stop and start, which is the worst condition a diesel engine can run in. You produce the most emissions. So it's really critical to get those off the road. And yeah, municipal, municipalities, uh, buses and trucks are a huge part of our market. Awesome. So the there are three or four segments that you list in your slides: um, airport, transit, corporate, and tourism. Which would you say you're seeing the most growth in? Oh, definitely the transit side. Um, there's been a lot of transit authorities in Canada and the United States that have committed to zero emission. Uh, right now, they're they're in the process of either doing a feasibility study um, or uh, or trying to go on their own. There's a lot of arguments saying that not every transit authority needs a feasibility study. You can use somebody else's. But uh, there's a group pushing that everybody should have one. And, and uh, really, it comes down to uh, consultants have already made enough money. Let's just do this. <laughs> awesome. So next question from Doug. How many 100% battery BYD vehicles are already on the roads in Canada? In Canada, we have, uh, of the buses, we have 32. And then of the uh, trucks, there are, uh, I think, seven right now. But we've got several, several orders in the pipeline. And we're making some very big announcements very soon. Uh, we we're, we kind of hold our uh, our cards close to our, our vest, so to say, so to speak. Um, we're not really going out there announcing orders before we have them. But we like to uh, make the announcements when when we we actually deliver. Absolutely. So the map that you showed, um, the buses were concentrated in I think Quebec, Ontario, BC, Alberta. Um, yeah, and, and I forgot Saskatchewan. Yeah, we do have a bus in Saskatchewan now at uh, Saskatoon Transit. Okay, yes, great. Yes, there's five provinces. 
Next question from Terry. The personal vehicles on the BYD site look appealing with about 190,000 sold last year, many in China. What's the barrier to entry for sales of personal electric vehicles in Canada? Well, that's a great question. And, and we do have some vehicles that are in um, Quebec. In fact, we have uh, the E6, which was the first electric car we brought out. Uh, it, it's the same design as 2008, but it still looks good. It kind of looks like a bigger Ford Edge. Um, and we use that for taxis. In, it's the only one that's allowed homologated to come into Canada and the United States. So we sold 25 to uh, Young Kwong, who runs um, e-taxi in, in Montreal. And unfortunately, it was just before the pandemic. He had, he had all set to order uh, quite, a, quite a few more, but then everything happened. And he's uh, now just kind of re redeveloping his business plan. But one of, the, one of the issues, again, it come down to um, protectionism of the, of the, the auto, um, auto industry in North America. It is very, it, there's a reason why there's CMBSS and FMBSS. It, uh, it, it kind of puts a restriction on the vehicles that you can bring in and, and they have, how they have to be qualified. Um, it doesn't matter if you get a, a, a European rating on your vehicle, if it's not tested for the Canadian North American market, then you can't bring it in. So really, um, it, it comes down to that is what homologation do we have to do testing to bring it in? To me, uh, they're beautiful vehicles. They, they drive amazing. They've got great range, the best battery in the business. And I'd love to see them here. Maybe, maybe it's sooner than later, but uh, I, I don't think we're going to see it anytime soon. Next, we have a question from class, and it's related to the charging system. I know you did, um, you showed some slides about Ampli, which is your uh, fleet charging partner. So class's question, are you involved with constructing bus vehicles charging systems? So yes, uh, we do make our own charging systems. Um, again, I, we, we make a, what's called a type two connection. Uh, it's an AC charger. Uh, when we originally started looking at buses, again, we want to knock down all the barriers. How can we get these buses in the quickest and easiest way? Um, so that was the battery warranty. And then we looked at, well, charging, you're going to have to put an infrastructure. Why don't we just give you the chargers? We had a very inexpensive AC charger with a type two connector and we would give it away with every bus. Well, within, within a year, um, they said, well, we don't want to be um, stuck using your charger. We want to use everybody's charger. So SAE 1772, they had a com the combo DC fast charging came out. The downside with DC fast charging is that the, uh, the vehicle itself has to have the, uh, the, sorry, the inverter is in the charger, so it's very expensive. We actually included the inverter in our bus, so our, our bus can be used to, uh, to power a grid. Um, bi-directional inverter can be used to power a, a mobile uh, mobility uh, a hospital, for example. So that's a really great advantage of having the inverter on board. So it, again, not getting into the charging manufacturing side of it is, you know, try to stay agnostic when it comes to that. It opens up the market a lot better for us. So what's a typical output for these chargers on the, on the full battery? Yeah, so we, we, go, um, we go anywhere from, we have a 20 kilowatt hour charger, it's just a small little one to all the way up to, uh, to 150 kilowatt hour DC fast charger. But the market today is with the, with the, um, top-down chargers, uh, pantographs, you know, some of them are up to 600 kilowatt hours. It's really just a quick charge, zap that battery and let it move on to the next station type of thing. Those are your short range electric buses. The problem with those stations are they're a million dollars or they, you know, they were, maybe they're a little bit less now, but a million dollars a station. And then, you know, it's also in the public. It's not really a great sight to see this big thing sticking up there with the pantograph that comes down. It's kind of a eerie future looking if you ask me. And, and I think that uh, you know the technology is increasing with with the induction charging that you're going to see you're going to see a lot more of that. You know, cities uh, they want to keep it clean, keep the routes clean. For I think sure. also, sorry not to labor. You look at the bus uh, the bus way, for example, or a BRT bus rapid transit. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more of that too. Cities don't want to spend billions of dollars. Look at Hamilton; they're going to spend three billion dollars to rip up the roads and put a rail system in. You know, I was, I was lucky enough to hear the uh, founder of uh, Hyperloop speak and he talked about the rail and he, he said, you know why a rail is as, as wide as it is? As two horses, rear ends could fit. And that's why it's as wide as it is. So we're still using this rail technology in cities. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't make any sense to spend billions of dollars on rail when you can use a, a bus rapid 
you know, electric bus rapid transit system easily. You know, it could be guided by something on the road. It's just a trackless tram, they call it. It's available in Europe now. So that's, that's where we need to go with this technology and charging and things like that. Awesome. Uh, next, we have an, another question from class. Are there any models where you convert the diesel vehicle buses from diesel to electric? So yeah, we don't do that, but uh, if my brother's watching, he'll be so happy because he's a, he's, he has a company that does that. They, they convert, they take the old diesel buses, you know, say uh, 2008 and older, and they'll convert those to, to electric. Um, you know, it, it's certainly something that's been done before. Dale Carson of, of CCW in California has been doing it for the last uh, eight years. He actually builds his own battery packs. Um, there's some questions around whether the durability of those buses, uh, whether they should be retested again because you're, you're putting battery packs on a roof or you're putting them somewhere in the vehicle that it wasn't built this type of structure. So, you know, what, it, what is the liability? Is that on the, the remanufacturer? Is it on the trans agency or is it on the other, the old, the OEM that sold it? So it kind of, you have to weigh the goods with the bads. And when you take a look at what is the cost of that, it's going to cost you $600,000 to do it. Well, an electric bus these days is around $850,000. So a diesel bus is 650, a brand new one. So the cost is coming down it, and it's not, everybody says, well, the price of batteries are gonna drop and, and that'll, that'll bring the cost down. That's, that isn't it. It's a come down to this volume. When volume has been, has created this ability to make the prices of the buses uh, less. And it's, uh, you're seeing the trans agencies now are actually budgeting that number instead of being 1.2 or 1.3 million a bus. It's very close to diesel. And of course, your ROI on that payback is so fast. Assuming with the first three years, you pay that bus back based on diesel fuel savings alone. Next, we have a question from Judy. We're looking for small shuttles, eight to nine person or so for micro transit for small communities. Do you have any small shuttles? Yeah, we do not. Again, I, I'm, I'm happy to promote any electric uh, electrification, replacing any gas and, and internal combustion engine. So there are several companies out there. Again, Carson um, out of Turkey is bringing a bus in. It's a small fit that niche too, where it's a, it's a small electric bus. Uh, I think it's up to 12 passengers, low floor access. I believe that PWT, Pacific Western Transportation, have a, a fully autonomous vehicle that's like that as well. So, you know, these technologies that are coming out fully autonomous, um, or, or even just the smaller ones that are, are micro, micro buses, I fully support that. But I think that you know, although we don't have anything, BYD doesn't, certainly should explore the market. It's worth looking at. Absolutely. I'm gonna interrupt for one second and ask Ted if you can um, stop your screen share because someone has requested to see just you. Oh no, it's my mom, isn't it? <laughs> okay. There we go. Thank you. No problem. Uh, next, we have a question from Lewis. Is BYD thinking of charging station station infrastructure in strategic Canadian locations? So not BYD in general, but uh, there are several companies that we're working with who are doing this. You know, there's there's a new company that's coming out, and, and I think they're going to launch in the next probably next three weeks. That's totally focused on this um, bus barns fleet electrification, whether it's delivery vehicles, commercial uh, taxis, they're going to be focusing 100% on that. And uh, you know, when, when, when they launch, it'll be a big thing. It's, uh, it's Kent Rathwell from uh, Sun Country Highway Company, and I think everybody's going to be pretty excited to hear what he's got to say. Next, uh, also from Lewis, we recently lost our Trans-Canadian bus service with Greyhound shutting operations. Do you think a bus service with a totally electric fleet can be viable? So here's my take on that. I mean, my answer is yes. And um, people may say I'm crazy, but I, I, here's how you do it. You have to use a, an extender. So how do you do with an extender? That's with, um, with hydrogen. I think a hydrogen fuel cell battery mixture for cross Canada fleet is perfect. It's something that we can, we can now start, as, as Canada Infrastructure Bank has money for electrification of buses, uh, we should be using that towards a fully electric fleet for Canada. Um, you know, there's, there's, 
everybody knows that the Greyhound wasn't successful because routes were, you know, profitable routes were being taken over by, by municipalities, uh, which is kind of difficult when you say, okay, we're going to take this one over and, and oh, that's, I know you made all your money on that one, but sort of keep operating on these other ones. So they shut down in BC, you know, a lot of things, uh, communities in BC, people resorted to hitchhiking instead of taking the bus. I think that's, that's terrible. We can't do that to people. Um, so we need to have a Canadian wide and it needs to be a Canadian, um, a, a nonprofit organization that runs it. So I'm, I, I would love to see a Canadian wide transit agency, zero mission and hydrogen. I mean, Ballard's got a great product out there. Uh, they know what they're doing in the fuel cell industry. Uh, and this is a great way to promote it. Thanks, Ted. Next, we've got a question from Rob about electric ambulances. Is there any appetite in Canada for electric ambulances? I'm a retired paramedic, hence my interest. Well, so again, we we have a platform that's that would kind of work for that. Now we're coming we're coming out with one. However, um, I think that you're seeing a lot of vehicles, um, a lot of vehicle manufacturers coming out with uh, designs that could be adopted by ambulances. You know, the ambulance typically is your Ford cutaway or your, uh, your, your GMC cutaway. Um, they're all coming out with electric platforms now. So there's no reason why the, an ambulance uh, manufacturer like Crestline could, could do this. They, they could easily put their platform on it. Now, again, it comes down to charging a little bit kind of an emergency situation. I know the ambulances in the last 10 years have certainly been used a lot more uh, during the day or during the, the time frame than they have been in the past certainly in Victoria where I am, we hear them quite a bit uh, for reasons that we know of. And so I think that uh, as, as your usage gets up, certainly there's an argument that you should electrify ambulances as well. It really comes down to the, the amount of time they're used. It, to me, school buses, doesn't make a lot of sense to electrify something you're using for four hours a day. You know, a transit bus you're using for eight to 10 hours a day. A truck, a bridge truck is going 10 hours a day. You've got um, 16 hours for the, for the um, uh, shunt trucks that are terminal terminal trucks those are the key ones taxis electrify those 18 hours 20 hours a day that's what you need to electrify get rid of the emissions from them awesome got a question from daryl on the garbage truck side and given that the TC, TTC has moved to EV buses can we see the city of toronto jumping on board with its garbage fleet as part of its procurement given that it's generally outsourced? Yeah, certainly I think it's 50% of the, of the fleet is owned by, the, by Toronto and then the rest is outsourced. Uh, Green, Green for Life, we've, we've had conversations with them. Uh, I don't know why they're called Green for Life. They have all diesel bus, uh, diesel trucks. Um, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, so we've, we've had conversations. They're, uh, they're kind of focusing on CNG, uh, so is waste management when it comes to the vehicles. There are trials out there with different companies. I know Line Electric has, uh, has some trials with, with different um, cities, but I see Toronto certainly uh, as part of their zero emission strategy. Uh, and I believe it's on their website, it's Transformation um, Toronto. It talks about the, uh, the greening of their fleet as well. So TTC also operate 400 non-revenue vehicles as, as well. And they're looking at how they could uh, green those. So uh, certainly with the, the models that we have, the class eight and the class six trucks, we can, we can move into uh, uh, supplying them more vehicles. And, and, and again, I'll say with a competition that's out there and coming, um, there's gonna be more electric vehicle producers in the market than there are diesel producers. And, and, and it is, it's already that way in the bus industry. We have, you can buy two diesel buses in Canada and you can buy five or six electric bus buses. So it's moved in a direction very fast. And uh, you know, I, I like to say that an, OE, an OEM producing a diesel bus is basically the cigarette manufacturer of the 80s. So <laughs> they need to stop and just say, we're not going to produce anymore. We're only going to produce uh, electric buses. And I think the industry would change on a dime. For sure. Next, we have a question from John. What sort of grade can your terminal truck climb? This has been mentioned as a limitation for switching to EV trucks at some terminals. 18%. I believe that is a 18% uh, is the, it could even be 21, I'm not sure. I know it's 18% that comes to mind right away. Yeah, we, the torque uh, on these vehicles is pretty, pretty powerful. It's um, put you back in your seat. 
got a policy question from Doug. Um, what new EV policy should the Canadian government implement to help expedite the, tr the transition to, um, we'll say, heavy duty electric transportation and, uh, and more broadly? So policy, I think that's a great, uh, great question. Um, I've been pushing for uh, no more diesel buses being funded by the Canadian government, first of all, or, or diesel trucks for that matter. Uh, we can't supplement a, a, a transit authority with 50% or sorry, 40% of their funds uh, for that bus, for a diesel bus. So I believe there is provisions now that uh, Minister McKenna has put in place that they won't fund diesel buses, but yet there's still some legacy um, uh, funding. For example, I think it's, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, PTIF, uh, they could still use that and buy a diesel bus. And it makes no sense to me that we're, as a government, as a country, committed to zero emissions, yet we're still funding diesel buses. I'm, I'm blown away every time I think about it and hear about it, but that's a legacy program that they can't really change. So I would say fund it, increase the, um, the incentives for consumer or sorry, commercial uh, vehicles, private fleets, and then, and then remove that in, after a few years. Once they've got, got the vehicles, they know how they work, um, you've, you've you allowed the market to actually catch up, uh, the OEMs to produce more to, to decrease their their costs eventually. Uh, then you then you do, then you get rid of the rebate and you're done. I think one more question, Laura, would be great if you could. Sure. Um, we've got a question from Lawrence. Do your vehicles and chargers allow vehicle to grid bi directional charging? How about charging suspension on, on command by real-time grid signals? Yeah, so through our partners, we, we do that as well. Uh, we have a, a partner um, called IO Controls, which is our backbone of our, of our uh, J1939. And they, they control the, uh, through uh, electric load management system they have, they can stop a, a vehicle from being charged if it's if a grid, uh, for example, if we hit a peak demand time and, and we recognize that, they'll shut down the vehicle from charging really kind of offset the load uh, over, the, over the vehicle itself. So over the, sort of the fleet itself. As far as the charging bi-directional, yes, we offer that. That's something that, that has been uh, the prime uh, offering from BYD since the beginning, uh, recognizing again that these can be used as mobile units to charge other things, charge vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to grid, vehicle to, uh, to um, uh, load. Awesome. Tim, we'll let you all right. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Ted. That was, you know, really illuminating. I, I, I guess I don't think enough about the commercial side personally, and uh, to hear uh, so many uh, really parallels with what we follow on the, um, you know, our personal vehicle electrification journey. It's very much the same thing, but you know, kind of on, on steroids. Uh, a lot of the same issues, the uh, same opportunities and so on. So uh, really, really a great talk. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ted. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks, Laura. Always, you're, you're, you're terrific. I appreciate you going through all those uh, questions and answers. So as we wrap up, I've got to tell you that uh, we have a special treat next month for our uh, July 6th episode of Canada Talks. Our guest will be none other than Mr. Sandy Monroe of Monroe and Associates. Uh, I'm sure most of you know Sandy or know about his work. Sandy's a, really a legend in the world of automotive and, and industrial design. And uh, his talk will address what Canadians should know about the state of electric vehicles and solid state batteries. So I think it's gonna be an amazing chance to hear directly from Sandy uh, and also to uh, get in some questions. So please uh, be sure not to miss next month's episode. So thanks for joining. I know it was a nice day today and uh, it must've been an awful temptation and a difficult decision to, to, to come on our webinar or, or sit outside uh, tonight, but i um, pleased that you decided to spend some time with us. And from all of us at Electric Vehicle Society, and until next month, plate, please stay safe and stay healthy. Uh, this concludes tonight's webinar. <laughs>